Good shot. Oh my! Yeah, to celebrate Georgetown, the Georgetown Raiders are Buckland Cup champions. The Trenton Golden Hawks, the R. Dudley Hewitt Cup champions, are going to Coburg. Back to Minerva. Shot scores, and the Coburg Cougars are the World Bank Cup champions. This is the OJ Today. Hey, welcome, folks. I'm Alex Bastiavansky. On the show today, uh, as is our tradition here on the OJ Today over the holidays, uh, instead of highlights and stuff, what we do is an overall review of what's gone on so far this season. And joining me first is uh, Alex Bloomfield, who's going to tell us all about what's happened so far in the Northeast Conference. Alex, welcome back to the show, buddy. Uh, good to have you on again. Uh, it's great to be here, as always. Excellent. So our uh, annual uh, holiday discussion about how things have gone so far in the OJ, you, of course, uh, covered the Northeast so closely, so we're going to chat with you about that. And uh, we're going to start in the North, which has become a real power this year. Um, talking about uh, New Market, I mean, they lost top scorer Todd, Win Todd Winter last year. Uh, coming on the heels of uh, pushing Trenton to six games, which surprised a lot of people that they were actually able to do that. But they built on that this year. Um, and they've been a lot of fun to watch so far, haven't they? Yeah, and I'm trying to get my finger on Newmarket, and I, I don't. It's really interesting. They brought a lot of their some of their guys back, about a, a mid-range amount of turnover from last season. I think it starts at the back end for them, honestly. Uh, Christian Di Donato, uh, Cole Tyson, they have a veteran group really that's starting to click, um, and they and they they click right out of the gate basically in this one. They had a concerning loss to Lindsay a couple weeks ago. People were a little worried, but if you actually look at the box score of that one, it was just Tyler Richardson with a 50 save out. Outing, so uh, I think I they think outshot they, them at least two to one in that yeah, game, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they did. So I, I New Mark has been pretty consistent all year long, uh, but they're not sort of walking away with this. So I, I don't know. I think there'll be much what we've seen so far is what we'll see in the second half. So if someone really gets hot, they could go past this team. Right, uh, the Aurora Tigers uh, up near the top all season. Uh, it's their 50th anniversary this year, and they're really doing that franchise proud. Such a storied history. Two Royal Bank Cups to their credit, of course, um, in the past. And uh, the Tigers have been, uh, they've been playing, uh, playing great so far, and uh, they're in contention as much as anyone else is for first place right now, aren't they? Yeah, and I think this is, if I were to pick one of the teams of the North that's going to come out of the North, it might actually be the Tigers, Tigers. right now. Yeah. Uh, 72 goals against uh, at one point in, in mid-December. Um, they're in around the, the leaders in that category. A lot of that's due to, to Bradley Van Schubert and the way he's been playing. One of the best goaltenders in the league this year, in my opinion. I think the best in the Northeast, for sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, you, you look at Jake Bricknell and how he's been able to... Uh, if you look at their makeup forwards wise, Jake Bricknell and his point totals compared to the rest of his teammates, he's got quite a gap there. It's not like most teams where there's two or three guys there at the top. He's really been the catalyst of that offense. Yeah. Power play wise, you look at his stats, three goals and 18 assists on the power play alone for Jake Bricknell. Um, he's been incredible to just uh, keeping them up there and, and in contention. And yeah, watch out for Aurora. They, they may come out on top of this, uh, the whole Northeast and, and the, certainly the North by the end of the year. I, I'm not convinced New Market will hold on. Yeah, and a great comeback story, of course, because they were, what, just above your Panthers last year from Pickering yeah. uh, in the North and, and doing so well this year. Anyway, uh, Markham, uh, been up there all year, as, as mentioned as well, uh, battling with those top three teams, uh, one of those top three teams. Um, lack of consistency, though, I would have to say, in a very concerning 10-3 loss to Aurora uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, for you, what's up with Markham? Are they for real this year? Um, yes, I think they're for real. I do think they're going to finish third in the North. Uh, I don't think they're going to hang on with those other two. Uh, they have they have the best line in the Northeast in Lucas Condotta, Jake yes. Jeffers, Brett Uderkirk. That line is is deadly. That's the one you got to stop. But you, if you do stop it, then I think you do shut down a lot of their offense. Uh, so if they can, you can really key on that line with this team. Um, their concern, of course, is goals against with them. They've, if you look at Aurora, for example, the, boat, the gap is about 50 between them. There's a few more games for Markham, but. Uh, Goaltending wise, Alex Bishop was supposed to solidify that. Hasn't really done it so far. 16 year old Cole Brady's been playing a lot of games lately. Um, they have some concerns at the back end, which I think may be a bit of a concern down the stretch and in the playoffs. So, um, yeah, Markham, I think, is a mid range playoff team, but uh, I don't think they're going to be around with the leaders. They had a big streak in November that got them up to where they are now. Um, I, I expect them to drop off a little bit, but you never know. There could be some moves made as well. I do want to touch on your Panthers. You are the play-by-play -play man for the Pickering Panthers. 
Great story this year after finishing last in the North last year. Uh, Coach David DiMarinis has really done a great job with that team, hasn't he? Yep, he's uh, been piecing it together in the offseason and then a little bit throughout the season as well. Andrew Hughes, Brock Trail has really solidified the top six, some good veteran scores there. Um, defensively, Dustin McFall, Joseph Franzen, elite puck moving defensive defenseman in my opinion. Uh, two reliable goaltenders now as well, which has been just the, uh, from the get-go really with Pickering this season and Adam Wisco, Ethan Langevin. Uh, Ethan Langevin. They, those two guys have been... Uh, just you know, mid-range goaltenders that are you can rely upon to pick up victories for you, which they haven't really had uh, in the past three, four seasons uh, with this franchise. So it's been nice to see Pickering. I think they're going to hang around and get in a playoff spot. Those bottom four positions could be anybody's in the Northeast, in yeah. my opinion. They, you know, they could be fifth to eighth. Lindsay Stovall, uh, both of them looking like it's going to be very tough for them to get in any sort of playoff contention right now. Uh, those two teams have sort of been separated from the rest so far, haven't they? Yeah, and I, I think they'll stay there. I don't, I don't see any divine interventions come, coming for these two. <laughs> <laughs> Stoville's dealt a lot of their assets. Nathan Torsia to uh, Georgetown, most recently the goaltender. Uh, Curtis Ryan, Andrew Hughes, of course. Um, they really haven't beat anyone significant since, uh, except for Lindsay since about mid-October. So uh, yeah, I don't believe Stoville's going to be... Uh, much more than what we've seen in them already. Lindsay, it's much the same way. Actually, surprisingly, have dealt off a lot more assets than in past years. They usually like to hang on to them despite uh, being near the bottom. But Brock Trail, Michael Chimney, uh, Darius Kondratis, uh, a lot of these guys have been sent off. Uh, and they got pieces back, not just cash. But uh, I don't think there are going to be any, any conversation. Looks like a fourth straight year without playoffs in Lindsay. Awesome, my friend. That is the North. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the East. OJ Today, coming up in just a moment. Hey folks, welcome back to the OJ Today. I'm continuing on now with our review of the Northeast Conference and we move to the East Division now. Alex Bloomfield uh, back with me via Skype. And Alex, uh, over the past couple of seasons, the East has been the, the power division in, the, in uh, the OJHL, if not in all of Canadian Junior A hockey. Um, such a strong division. Uh, this year, not quite. I think they've succeeded that title to someone else. But um, uh, still, Wellington uh, leading the way in uh, in uh, the East and uh, the top record so far in the Northeast Conference. Yep, the Wellington Dukes, they're, they're the team to beat in the Northeast all around, I'd say, at this point. Um, you're right that uh, the East itself is not uh, nearly as good as it was last year, especially. Uh, the Dukes, the only team sort of remain of that uh, top, uh, really, five, all five teams last year that were pretty good. Um, Jonah Capriotti is the big find for them in goal, but midway through the season, solidifying sort of their one weakness they had coming into this year. Uh, Depth-wise, they're very strong. Obviously, they're the seven NCAA Division One commitments on this team. Um, so they got a lot of young, good players uh, that may be leaving them a little earlier than, than some other players might now that probably won't have them till their 19, 20-year-old seasons. But uh, the, these are this is a young team with Great scoring, and, and it's not just on the top line either. It's it's all the way through. Um, if there's one weakness, I have to point out, it's the power play, actually. with the It's kind of surprising Oddly, with the yeah, firepower. Yeah. They have a fifth in the Northeast for a team that's first in the in the Northeast. So that's uh, it's a bit of a concern for them. It's something they need to work on to get those uh, goals when they get the opportunities in the playoffs. You know how important that is. Of course, and kudos to Scott McCrory for the job he's done there in his first Absolutely. year in Wellington. Also acquiring Mason Snell from his old team in Whitby, uh, Penn yeah. State commit. Anyway, Wellington looking very, very good so far. Um, Kingston started a bit slow, but as you like to say, every time I've had you on the show, uh, you never ever count out the Kingston Vs because they're up there every year. Uh, they make it work and they're doing that again this year after a slow start. Kingston has looked much better as they've gone along, haven't they? And on a huge streak uh, from late October through to pretty much the end of November. And uh, yeah, they can flat out score. Uh, they, they, I think uh, they top two in the Northeast in goal scoring, maybe in the league as well. They're not top line reliant either. Ten forwards returned to Kingston from last season. So you look up and down, like, the best in, in terms of chemistry. These guys have played together. They're a veteran team. They've eight forwards over 20 points. Uh, so, you know, it's... That, that's their biggest strength, I'd say, with Hickson is you can't key on anybody, that they can have score from the fourth line on you at times with pretty uh, good consistency. Uh, Peter Goulet has been, been working things out well there. I think Kingston is the most consistent team amongst those bottom four in the East, and I think will likely come out in second in this division and potentially third in the Northeast. So, mm. uh, yeah, definitely another good year for Kingston where they could uh, make some noise in the playoffs. Uh, Trent Golden Hawks, uh, the Dudley Hewitt Cup champions, and as well uh, two years in a row, um, we knew it was going to be a bit of a rebuilding year for Trenton, losing so many veterans from last year's team. But Trenton hasn't been half bad. I mean, they're flirting around this, sitting around the 500 mark right now. 
Um, but, uh, you know, are, are you surprised by how competitive Trenton has been this year um, with the expectations that we had at the start? I don't know if I'm surprised. I think I, I think I expect them to be around where they are right now. Uh, they're a little bit volatile for me. They had a lot of roster transition in the early going. I'm not sure where that sets them up as far as moves they can make near the deadline here. Uh, but you're right. It is a rebuilding year for them. I, I think they're going to be about where they are right now come season end. They've played a few more games as well early on in the, in, in the season here. Max Ewart's been a, a nice... Um, addition for them, I think he's been one of their best forwards, if not their best forward, uh, going forward. Mac Lewis has regressed a little bit, in my opinion. He's uh, someone that was on the team last year, but uh, hasn't really stepped up into that number one role. But uh, it's goaltending that's a, that's a problem for Trenton and Carson Poole and Will Roski. They got to figure that out. Um, they were sort of flipping back and forth. Now they've been super consistent uh, and disciplined as well. Second most um, in penalties against this team, uh, and uh, that's. You can't do that. They have 750 penalty minutes when most teams had around 500 this yeah. year, and that's uh, that's not where you want to be. Uh, the defending Royal Bank Cup champions, it still feels good to say that, actually. <laughs> the Coburg Cougars, who shocked everybody last year. Uh, similar to Trenton, a rebuilding year from them. Uh, lost so much of their roster. Veterans who are now gone. Play, a lot of guys playing at the next level. Um, but uh, Coburg it started slow, and then since hiring Jerome DuPont back in early November have really played like an entirely different team, barring that really bad loss to Newmarket yeah. last week. But they've really played a lot better and are sitting a lot better in the standings now, aren't they? Yep. And, uh, you know, they, they've been competitive, especially since that transition management-wise, for sure. I, I think they have room to make moves as well, more so than a Trenton, for example. Uh, I think the key here actually is what other teams are going to do in the Southwest. If they can get assets from, say, Orangeville, Burlington, St. Mike's, Mississauga, those teams on the bubble in the Southwest, um, and they, they decide, obviously, there's a big playoff race going on out there. If one of them decides to drop back from that, sell off some assets, I think Coburn might be in line first to pick some of those up. Uh, George Miranda is their top goal scorer. They don't, they don't uh, overwhelm you with their, their firepower up front, for sure. Um, but uh, Coburn's a sneaky team. They also have those... Uh, hookups with other leagues that they often seem to pull in players near the January deadline. So yeah. uh, we'll see uh, what the Cougars do. I, I'm a little, I'm expecting them to move up a bit actually from where they are now. Okay. Whitby, a uh, horrible start to the year. I mean, I think they won two of their first 20, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, but really, really rough start for them. But they as well have turned a corner over the last little bit. They're playing much, much better. And as you watch them crawl in the standings, I would say a playoff berth is not entirely out of the question if they continue to play as strong as they are right now, correct? Yeah, about, about a month ago, I'd say it looked like the Northeast was settled in terms of playoff teams. I'm not so sure now. This yeah. Whippy team certainly has a shot at it. I think Coburg, Trenton, Pickering, they're all looking in the rearview mirror. Just, you know, they're, they're checking the other towns. They're, they're watching hockey TV as soon as they, uh, you know, get into the dressing room, they're making sure Whippy's not winning again. Um, Post Mason Snell trade, honestly, they've been better. Uh, Interesting. They have a lot of assets yeah. in that trade. Jason Stachelbeck, uh, uh, Greg Smith, Roy Milne, Nick Durge, Lilia, uh, Dylan Laddie. These guys joined the team. Uh, St Stachelbeck, just really quick, one of the hottest players in the league yeah. right now. I think he had nine goals in his, his last 10 games or something. He's been great, he hasn't does. he? Yeah. He has been. Yeah, they've they've found a mix there that's working. And if they have the, the games left against the teams that are ahead of them, they, if they put a few wins together here over the holidays and, and into, uh, you know, the second half, they, they can definitely be right in it come uh, February. Beautiful. Listen, thanks so much for taking the time again. Uh, we're going to catch up with you in the new year, but thanks again and happy holidays, Alex. Yep, have a good one. Okay, uh, OJ Today, coming back in just a moment, Alan Corkum will join us to talk about the Southwest Conference. Thank you. Hey folks, welcome back to the OJ Today. Uh, from the Northeast, now we move to the Southwest Conference. And as promised, it's Alan Corkum joining me via the wonders of Skype. Uh, Alan is the play-by-play -play man for the Georgetown Raiders and uh, also the host, the co-host of uh, OJHL Rinkside, uh, which covers all the teams in the Halton region. But this is a guy who knows the Southwest backwards and forwards. Alan, we've been trying for so long to get you on the show, buddy. Happy to finally have you on. Thanks for doing this. Thank you very much for having me, Alex. Appreciate it. We're going to take a look at the Southwest, uh, as mentioned. And uh, you know what? Um, it's uh, the Oakville Blades. Uh, great season so far. And what does it get them? It gets them a four-way tie for first uh, in, the, uh, in the South Division, which is basically, we think, it's got to be the toughest division so far uh, in the entire OGHL. But just talk about Oakville so far. Let's start with them and what you think of the Blades so far. 
Well, they've looked very impressive, Alex. I've covered them a few times with my uh, Coach Go TV, as, you, as you've said. They look very well. They have a great one-two tandem in that with Jetta, or pardon me, Kirsten Perbu and Brian Elliott. They've been both excellent this year. Chris Elliott, I should say, like an NHL on the line, sorry for that. They've been a one-two punch. They're two of the top goalies in the league, and they also have some great scoring power. They picked up Thomas Baia in the offseason from the Milton Ice Hawks, and he's been their leading scorer this year with 39 points. Another pickup, Matt Graham has been also as well, 36 points. And don't forget super rookie Zach Bramwell, who's coming there and fit nicely with that team after some losses like Bryce Bisley and Drew Orad. Yeah. Uh, the Patriots, a team that, uh, you know what, people thought could surprise in the playoffs last year. They finished the regular season really strong. Uh, got knocked out by a very strong Burlington Cougars last team in the last year in the playoffs. They were building more towards this year, and they've been one of the top teams in the OJ so far, haven't they? Oh, absolutely. They have lots of scoring power. Three of the top ten scorers in the league are from the Patriots. And Andrew Petrucci leading the way at 58 points, and then Oliver Benwell just behind him, and then Dante Spagliolo just down there as well. They have been a great team this year. The thing that's going to help them down the stretch, Alex, in the second half, is games in hand. They have five games in hand yeah. over Oakville. They're only four points behind them in the South Division, which is probably the group of death this year in the OJHL, where yeah. last year it was the North Division. Exactly. I'd say you're exactly right on that. Um, the Junior Canadians, very exciting year for them. It's been the Jack and uh, Jake show. Uh, Jack McBain, of course, who's looked at as a, a likely first-round NHL draft pick. Jake Joffe, his line mate, has been unbelievable. Uh, but overall, the Junior Canadians, uh, just tremendous performance so far. Yeah, McBain and Joffe have looked lights out for the Canadians. That's why they're staying in the thick of things in that South Division. They're tied right now for third place, just behind Oakville, four points as well. And if McBain and Joffe keep up these offensive numbers, they're going to be going lights out. Gonna, the only thing I think is going to be a little bit of a question mark for them down the stretch is the goaltending. Dalton Ewing has to be a bit better. He's had a bit of three goals against average, but Christian Mediachi has come in and done some great things as a backup for Toronto, getting 10 wins and two losses. So he might get the start set and stretch. We'll have to see how that goes, Alex. Well, you say inconsistent at times, but it's funny because Dalton's been a mainstay on the top five. I think we've had him on three times. So when he does make saves, they're big ones. But as you said, maybe just a bit more consistent down the road. Yeah. Um, it's amazing, though. Four teams, four teams within, I think, four points of each other right now uh, in that division. Yep. So competitive, the fourth team being the North York Rangers, um, who have been so strong this year, um, led by, among others, uh, NHL uh, Vegas Knights draft pick Nick Campoli, who just got back from Team Canada East at the World Junior A Challenge. Yeah, he's looked very good this year, Campoli. He hasn't missed a beat as well since coming back. He had an injury plague season last year, but still got a draft pick in the NHL by Las Vegas. Another player to compliment him this year is Ross Krieger, who spent a brief time in the Georgetown Raiders. So I saw him for a little bit before getting traded North York. He's been an offensive juggernaut for that team. And you can't, can't forget about the goal tank, probably the best duo in the OJHL right now. Colby Mews and Jed Alexander, they're one and four respectively in goals against and save percentage in the league. And with those two going high still, you watch out that team in the second half. Yeah, Jed Alexander, another player who just got back from the World Junior A Challenge. Uh, he was, yep. He's been great for the Rangers this year. Uh, St. Mike's, uh, you know what? Um, just It's a tough division to be stuck in, that, uh, that South Division for them. They haven't been bad this year by any means. They're around the 500 mark right now. Um, but just uh, they're really going to have to up their game, aren't they, if they hope to uh, get a playoff spot. They're going to be battling for that final playoff spot this year, aren't they? Yeah, right now they're in th the thick of things with Orangeville and Buffalo for that final couple seats in the Southwest Conference. I think they have a long way to go. They're well behind the top four in that South Division, so they may as well just write that off to get to the top. But just get themselves in the playoffs, maybe get on a nice winning streak before going into the playoffs. We'll see what happens. They're led by their captain, Cameron Searles, who's had a great season there in the top 20 in scoring. I think the goaltending, another question that's going to have to be settled, I think a little more consistency, but Jack Watson has done a great job there as well, along with Cosmo Lazzarino. Yeah, and uh, finally we get to Mississauga, and Mississauga, a team that's missed out on the playoffs for the last few years, head coach Joel Washkarak, such a well-respected guy throughout the league. He's also a scout for the uh, OHL's Oshawa Generals. <clears throat> They've <laughs> just desperate to get back into the playoffs, and they started off so well this year. They've got two wins against the Georgetown Raiders, of course, the defending Buckland Cup champs. But over the last few weeks, a bit of a slide, and they've kind of fallen out of that playoff picture right now, haven't they? Yeah, they have. It's too, it's too bad, Alex, because they were having such a great start. They're right in the thick of things in the playoff race, but then they've gone a bit of a tailspin in the last few weeks, and they find themselves now nine points behind St. Mike's in the playoff race. They have a lot of work to do, but if they play Georgetown a couple more times and upset them, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> 
So we'll see what happens there. But yeah, a couple of big wins against them. They beat Trenton early on in the season. So they've done some things, and they've been led by Chris Carabasas, who has 39 points this year. And the goaltending of Daniel Murphy, who was doing so well, he's going on now to the Erie Otters. They're going to have to count on another strong goaltender, Luca Durante. You heard that name, you know, of Stefano, his brother, who was the winning goalie on the RBC Cup champion over last, last, last year. So he's yeah. going to step in and hold the fort for Miss Saga the rest of the way. Right, and something we'll talk about a little bit on other shows, of course, is the upcoming a CGHL Prospects game. Very exciting stuff yeah. for the Chargers as they've been named as uh, the host for the CGHL Prospects game. 25 seconds, just really quick. That's huge for the organization, isn't it, obviously? Oh, it is for sure. To have it at that nice, beautiful arena in Port Credit. It's, it's a classic arena. It's been used many times for commercials and now it's been the showcase of all the top prospects in the Canadian Junior Hockey League. And that should be a great time here in late January when the new year hits. Absolutely. Thank you, buddy. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and talk about the West Division. More OJ today coming up in just a moment. Welcome back to the OJ Today, folks. Uh, I continue on now via Skype with uh, Georgetown Raiders play-by-play man and the host, host of uh, OJHL Rinkside, uh, Alan Corkum. And Alan, we move to the West Division now. And uh, last year's Buckland Cup champions, the Georgetown Raiders, now we knew it was going to be very, very tough to top last season. Obviously, they were such a powerhouse last year. Um, this year, I mean, they're leading the West. They're by no means having a bad season. I just think that Raiders fans have been spoiled for so long now. I mean, these guys have been just year in, year out, pretty much the most consistent organization over the last, if you want to say, decade in the OJHL, always up near the top of the league, um, but uh, not quite as strong so far this year as they were last year, and they even had to go through a six-game losing streak, didn't they? Yes, they did, and that was their longest losing streak since 2006. So since I've been covering the Raiders, that was definitely the longest streak they've had. And it looked, it's very weird to see them lose. They had a couple of overtime losses in that stretch, Alex. One to Blades and then one to Pickering. But they did snap that six-game losing streak in a big way with a big, big upset win over the Toronto Patriots, 5-2. So an impressive win there. Andrew Corkin had a couple of goals. And he's been counted on this year for some of the offense, as well as newcomer Jason Smith, who came over from the Barry Colts to the OHL. He leads the team in scoring with 39 points. He's having a great season. And don't forget about the goaltending of Mario Cavalieri, who's been in the top five in stats all season. He had a bit of a downstretch in that losing streak, but he seems to be back on track after that big win against the Toronto Patriots. Yeah, absolutely. Um, behind them now and making up ground over that six-game losing streak, obviously, because they've been doing well. Uh, the lone American squad, the Buffalo Junior Sabres, um, the Sabres, uh, what can you say? I mean, they're always a very, very tough team to play against. Even last year in the playoffs where the Raiders uh, took them out, and I believe it was five, they left them black and blue in that opening round series, even though the Raiders won. But Buffalo, uh, don't count them out this year. They've looked pretty good so far, haven't they? Yes, they have. They have a game in hand on Georgetown. They're only six points behind. And don't forget, Alex, they played Georgetown twice this season already. And both times, the Sabres came out victorious, 7-3 and 7-4, even getting a win in the tough building in the Alcott Arena in Georgetown. So they got some great weapons, some good veterans back at them. Try to win some Christian DeFelice. Matt Jakubowski is leading the offense. And they've had some strong goaltending, especially those two wins against the Raiders from Brian George. So the Sabres might be... A team of surprise Raiders. We'll have to see if they'll be on our doorstep in the second half for the top spot in the West Division. Absolutely. Orangeville hanging in there around third place right now. It's changing daily, of course, as we speak. But uh, Orangeville around the 500 mark so far. Um, same thing. This is a team that plays hard every time they come out. Uh, Justin Teekle's got that team playing well. Uh, just need a bit more consistency. What do you think of Orangeville so far? Yeah, I just recently got to see them play, uh, covering a game for Coach Co. against Oakville. They had some very good speed, lots of speedy players. They lost that game, but they have a lot of speed with Rocco Andrietti, Hudson Lambert, who's a good player. Uh, don't forget Vince Bonnewito and then Dan Burner, the former Raider. They got lots of offense there. Just they need a little more consistency, as you said, Alex, to uh, maybe get over. I think they have enough strength, though, and enough speed and skill to get into the playoffs this year. I just don't know how far they're going to get. But it's definitely a stepping stone for Orangeville because last year they missed the playoffs. Of course, so they'd be happy just to get back in there at the, as a start anyway. Um, Burlington, not a single player on the roster now returning from last year's squad, and they were strong last year. Uh, they made the uh, conference semis. A lot of people thought they were going to take out Oakville, but they went down uh, to the Blades, uh, but uh, I mean, it's a, it's an entirely different roster this year. Uh, it's a young team. Uh, you cover the uh, Cougars. You do some of their broadcasts. Uh, your analysis of what you've seen from Burlington so far? 
I think it's just about a, just gelling with chemistry in that team. There's been so many changes there since the start of the season. Actually, include the offseason with Mark Duras being relieved of his duties, which is a big shock. And then it started with that big trade of Mario Cavalieri up to Georgetown, and then it seemed like the dominoes just fell from there. All the veterans traded. The last one was Matt Gorey that traded Newberg. They have a few good players still there. Justin Riche is doing what he can in net as a starter for Burlington, and they're being led by Matt Galley, who came over from North York to trade for Josh King. Camilleri. So he's doing some good things. He has about I think, 25 points on the season, but I think Burlington has some work. Right now they're on the outside looking in in the playoff picture. I think they got to get on a stretch right now, maybe get on a winning stretch if they have any shot of getting in the playoffs. They may squeak into that eighth spot, but I think it's going to be tough because they have a lot of young players. They might be more built for next year than this year, Alex. A lot of work ahead of them if they want to grab that, that eighth playoff spot. Uh, finally, we move to a team that's just really had it tough over the last few seasons. Now the Milton Ice Sox. Boy, oh boy, I, you know, Mario Chiquillo, such a well-respected coach. He got brought in there to Milton this year. This is a guy, of course, who was the head coach of the Niagara Ice Dogs before. Um, he's been a coach with Team Canada East before. Very well-respected coach, great guy. Um, it's, it's disappointing for him, obviously, to come into the situation. Very young team. I mean, they've got some players looking towards the future, for sure. You wanted to talk about Bataglia, of course, who's been a bright spot on this team. He, of course, is well on Team Canada East. Yeah, he had a great season. He's had a uh, over 900 save percentage, a just under four goals against. He's having some great numbers. It's been a tough year again. It's been the third year in a row that Milton has been looking way up at everybody else in the stands. And it's very tough for Mary Steele. He's a great guy. I talked to him many times before games out in the Halton region. So it's very tough to see. But they have a good young team. But you look around the league now, you see all the ex-Milton Ice Hawks flourishing in other spots. You see Derek McVay and Justin Paul in Georgetown, Thomas Bay in Oakville. Eric Chipolini just got traded. He's now the junior Canadians flourishing with Joffe and McBain. So you imagine if those players would have been kept by Milton and they would flourish like that with them, you never know where this team could be. They may be knocking on the playoff door. So they're grooming the players. They're just grooming them for other teams is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. It's like unfortunate. Yeah, hopefully I'll, Milton will pick it up in the new year. Um, listen, that's it, buddy. We are out of time. But uh, keep up the great work uh, with ringside and with the great play-by-play -play work you do for the Georgetown Raiders. And uh, Merry Christmas to you and the family. Happy holidays, buddy. And uh, have a great holiday season. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Al. Just don't forget, everybody, uh, Al Gallo and I, every Wednesday and Friday on Coach TV, 7 o'clock for ringside. And Merry Christmas, happy holidays to all your viewers as well, Alex. Will do, Alan. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that's all the time we've got for this week. But uh, just remember, folks, OJHL.ca to keep up to date with all your latest league news, stat standings, and stories, and of course, all your social media outlets there for you to check out as well. Happy holidays to everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week.